So I'd like to take this opportunity to go ahead and state the obvious. Jacob was an answer to prayer. He didn't sneak into existence, right? It wasn't like God was scrolling through Twitter or learning the newest TikTok trend, right? No, when Isaac prayed, God heard that prayer and he answered it. You are exactly the same. Now, you might have been a surprise to your parents, but you are no surprise to God. It's no matter of chance that you were born in the time, the place, and to the family that you were born. Paul says it this way in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. So God decided when you would be born. God decided where you would be born. And God decided the family that you would be born into. Now, for some of us, that idea generates a whole bunch of good feelings, right? You reflect back on your childhood, your upbringing, and you're joyous about it. You're excited about it. You're happy about it. But there are others, possibly even in this room, who when you think back on your upbringing, you think about your childhood, it's difficult for you to grapple with the idea that it was God who put you in your family. But I believe that Jacob shares some of those emotions as well. Genesis 25, verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Because Isaac had a taste for wild game, he loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Imagine growing up in a home where you are constantly in competition with your siblings for the love of your parents. Imagine how Jacob must have felt when the realization set in that he would never be able to get his father's love because he could not give his father what he wanted. His father loved wild game more than he loved his son. Yet God saw fit to put him in that family. Why? You know, I asked myself this question a bunch as I was reading through this. And listen, I would love to give you a simple answer. But I think oftentimes simple answers fail to truly capture the nuance and complexity of the human experience. I think that simple answers typically rob God of his glory and they don't really capture the wisdom of his plan. So I don't know why God put him in his family. I don't have a simple answer for you, but here's what I do know. It would have been extremely difficult growing up with that family dynamic. And no amount of understanding would have made it any easier. Now, maybe you've never considered Jacob's story from this perspective, but when you do think about it in this manner, it begins to make sense why Jacob did the things that he did. Of course, he manipulated his brother out of the birthright. He wanted his father's love. He was probably jealous of his brother. How many of you in this place can say from experience, jealousy will make you stupid? <laughs> Somebody said it this way. It's amazing the clarity that comes with psychotic jealousy. <laughs> Someone else said it this way. Dear haters, I couldn't help but notice that awesome ends with me and ugly starts with you. Jealousy <laughs> We'll make you crazy, church. <laughs> now, I'm hanging on this point a little bit. Because if I can prove to you that Jacob's behavior was normal, then maybe I can prove to you that your behavior is normal. See, I, I know that, like, you think you're the only one who has fears. 
You're the only one who has doubts. You're the only one who's struggling through life. I know you think that you're the only one who woke up this morning and didn't want to come into the house of God. I know you think you're the only one who's like, oh, my marriage, is, you know, I would rather be with someone else or be somewhere else, and I don't know how to resolve this. I know that you think you're the only one who faces hardship. But listen, these things are normal. They are consistent with the human experience. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except for what is common to mankind. Now, I know this verse is talking about how God helps us to escape temptation when it comes, but I think we blow right by the fact that scripture just said temptation is common. The way that we feel and the way we respond to those feelings are normal. Yet we're so quick to condemn ourselves when we don't measure up to the arbitrary standards that we created, not God, we created for ourselves. But listen to me, Jacob could not escape his childhood and you will not escape your past. You will not outgrow it. You can't suppress it. And there's not three quick steps or two simple payments of 1999 that can get healing delivered to your front door. No, only God can heal you. And often, God uses the rest of our lives, healing the wounds from the beginning of our lives. So I don't know why God placed Jacob in his family. I don't know why God placed you in yours or all of us in this generation. But here's what I do know. God is good. His plan is good. And he will work every aspect of your life for good. You are when and where God says you are. And we have no power to be anywhere else. You know, I think about my story. I was born into a single parent home. I grew up in a Tough city, not the worst, but not the best either. A lot of my role models were hip-hop artists, gangbangers, drug dealers, playboys. My ancestors were slaves. And although I serve my country with pride, there are people in this country that hate me because of my brown skin. And I have no power to change any of that. But as long as I resist the fact that this is my reality, I'll be a slave to a fantasy, a world that I created for myself. But God didn't call me to be a slave, but a son of the truth. Jesus said, if you keep my word, you will be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will not find freedom in the future that you simulated in your mind. You will not find Freedom as you relive and rework your past. No, the only way to find freedom is in the power and the presence and the grace and mercy of Jesus. God placed you here, which means that there is no better place for you than here. And no better time for you than right now. You know, I don't recall a single time in scripture where it says Jesus was aloof or Jesus was distracted or Jesus was daydreaming. But I do remember scripture saying this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. Jesus' statement is profound. Did you know that there is only one period of time where you can experience gratitude? We call it right now. The present moment is the only moment that you can experience and benefit from gratitude. Listen to me. If I was grateful yesterday, that does nothing for my feelings of scarcity today. And I have no idea how to be grateful in the future from the present. Melody Beatty says this, gratitude 
turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity. It makes sense of our past. It brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. You know, I think the tension between our expectations and our reality, I think these things help us to understand that the world has nothing to offer that can truly satisfy our souls. I mean, it's not like God is egotistic. It's not like he's self-absorbed. Church, he doesn't need us to need him. That would be a cheap trick. Yeah. I knew he would get it. So, so go back after service. Go watch the VOD. Listen to the words. Do a Google search. You'll get it. Sorry. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> We need God, church. I think about it this way. My children, they need me. And my role and my responsibilities to them will change as they get older, but they won't outgrow their need for me. And I believe that God allows life to teach us that same lesson. So let me say it again. You are when and where God says you are. And I don't know how you got here, or what you had to endure to get here. But I do know this. God knows. He put you in the best time and place for you. And if you're still here, then that means that there's more goodness on the way. Amen, church? Yeah. All right, my second point. You are what God says you are. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so God created mankind in his own image. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 and 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Pro preacher trip right here, uh, tip right here. I'm going to help you guys out. Open your bottle of water before you get up here. <laughs> they don't teach you that, man. You just get up here and try to crack your bottle of water and look silly. Uh, if we're honest, oh, excuse me. This temptation that, this was a temptation that led to the fall, right? And this is the same temptation that I believe plagues many of us today. You are not enough, and what you have is not enough. See, it's not enough for us to have life. We got to have the American dream. It's not enough for us to have the American dream. We got to be rich. It's not enough for us to be rich. We got to be powerful. But run as fast as you can, gain as much as humanly possible, but at the end of the day, you will still be human. If we're honest, we're not just trying to outrun our past. We're trying to outrun our present. We're running from our humanity. We hide our insecurities. We avoid vulnerability. We try to become the source of our own provision. But the question still stands, who told you that you were naked? In other words, who lied to you? Who said that God's creation was anything less than good? Who said that God left something to be desired? But we despise what we are. We hate our humanity. And in this way, we're actually very much like Esau. And if you don't think that's a problem, let me show you something. Mark chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus recites the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohinu, Adonai Echad. This is the most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second 
is this, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Church, it's difficult to love your neighbor as yourself when you don't love yourself. Self-hatred makes it practically impossible to obey God's commands. Now, it's easy for me or for anyone else, for that matter, to say you should just love yourself. But it's not lost on me that in our story, Jacob didn't receive the love of his father. And when you grow up without the love of your parents, it's hard to think of yourself as lovable. Jacob didn't have the love of his father, and I know from experience that that's a difficult way to grow up. But instead of working through those emotions, instead of being vulnerable, he actually chose the same route that Adam and Eve did, but his fig leaves were the birthright and the blessing. He says, what I am is not enough, so I take this birthright, and I take this blessing. Do you see me now? Am I worthy now? I was like Jacob. I undervalued myself. I moved through life desperately trying to add accolades to myself in hopes that I could validate my existence, but It didn't matter how much success I had because I wasn't convinced. I could always find a reason why I wasn't worthy of love and acceptance. I know that I'm not alone. And church, this mindset has to change in us. See, I believe that God made you to be uniquely you. And one of the greatest ways that we glorify God is bringing our full person to bear in every scenario of life. We do this by living open and honest and unapologetic. Matthew chapter 5, verse 15. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. You all familiar with a Christmas story? All right, so there's a scene in the movie where the family is sitting down having dinner, and there's a delivery that comes to the door. Dad jumps up. He rushes to the door. He's all excited, right? He brings the package inside. He opens it up. He digs through the packaging, and he pulls out a lamp in the shape of a woman's leg wearing high heels and fishnet stockings. And my man is going nuts about this thing, right? This is the best thing since sliced bread. He's all going crazy over it, and his wife is all repulsed, and Ralphie is running his hand down the side of the leg. He even goes as far as to go outside and have his wife position the lamp right in the middle of the window so that the whole neighborhood could see it. Why are we talking about this? Church, you are the leg lamp. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm the leg lamp. (laughs) Y'all did it. I can't believe it. Look at your neighbor and say, there's something wrong with the preacher today. (laughs) But in all seriousness, church, we don't have to be ashamed of the light that's in us. All of your weaknesses, all of your frailty, all of that in the hands of God becomes a means for his glory to shine in and through your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Listen to me, church. God is not ashamed to be the source of your strength, and you should not be ashamed to be the vessel of his glory. What does that mean? 
Well, it means you're going to have to become accustomed with a little bit of weakness. You're going to have to be accustomed to a little bit of hardship, a little bit of difficulty. You're going to have to accept the fact that you are what God says you are. Are we made in his image and his likeness? Yes, we are. But like I tell my kids sometimes, we are not the same, homie. We are not God. And no amount of accomplishments or success will make us invincible or self-sufficient. We see this in Jacob's story. Getting the birthright and the blessing actually kind of ruined his life. Like, isn't that wild? He did all that work, all that manipulation, all that scheming. He gets what he wants, and his life is worse off than when he started. And the reason why is because when it comes to the work of art that God has done in our lives, that God is doing in our lives, I think we are like children with crayons trying to outdo Van Gogh. We are like single key pianos trying to outperform Mozart. We have nothing to add to the work that God is doing in us. We simply need to trust him, church. Amen. Yeah, the work is finished, and yet it's still ongoing. It is good, and yet it's still getting better. You are what God says you are, and that's enough. This brings me to my final point. You are who God says you are. Genesis 32, verse 22. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. So Jacob was left all alone, and there a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he struck the socket of Jacob's hip and dislocated it as they wrestled. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And Jacob requested, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob gets into a wrestling match with God. While they're struggling, God hit Jacob in the hip and dislocated it. Now listen, y'all. I don't know if you read this story, but when I read it, it was funny. I, I laughed. The scripture is kind of wild to me. God hit this man in his hip and dislocated it. I've been in whole car accidents that have not dislocated my hip. So let me tell you something real quick about me. Listen, if we get into a fight and you hit me in my hip and that thing comes out of the socket... You are officially the winner. Apparently, I underestimated how strong you are. <laughs> Church, I think sometimes we associate growth in the faith with limitations coming off. And maybe it's because there's such an emphasis in our culture on independence, but that's not the example that we take from this story. God says, what's your name? He says, my name is Jacob. God says, that was your name, but now your name is going to be Israel. Why? Because God sees the heart. God sees who we are. Yes, it doesn't always show up the way that it should. Yes, sometimes it gets you into a little bit of trouble when your personality traits, your characteristics are exaggerated. But God looked past all that. He sees who Jacob is. He calls him by his name, and he sees who you are, and he calls you by your name as well. We grow up in Christ. And we don't become more independent. We become more dependent. The more I know him, the more I know I need him. 
And you hear people kind of hint at this in church, right? They'll say something to the effect of, when I was young in the faith, you couldn't tell me nothing. Or five years ago, if they would have said that to me, I would have cursed them out. But now you can't harbor unforgiveness. Now you don't go out of your way to be rude to people. Now you're a little bit more thoughtful about the impact of your words. Why? Because you're more dependent on Christ and you're not trying to do things in a way that are pleasurable to you. You're trying to please the Father. Finding your identity in Christ will always come with greater limitations. But these limitations, this increased dependency, these new Boundaries are proof that you belong to Jesus. So, as the great philosopher G. Klump said, you'll walk over here, but you're limping back. <laughs> First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm closing. Worship team, if you can make your way up. Let me talk to you briefly about the title of Messiah. You know, this title, we use it with Jesus, but it was not a title that belonged exclusively to him. Or at least it wasn't a title that was exclusively used with him. Messiah simply means the anointed one of God. Exclusively used in reference to him. Not exclusively used in reference to him. For instance, kings were anointed. When Samuel found David, he anointed him. When David was being pursued by Saul and he cut the corner of his garment... The conviction that he felt in his heart was that he should not harm the Lord's anointed. But it wasn't just kings that were anointed. Priests were also anointed. Aaron and his sons were anointed, and all the priests that came after them were anointed. And although it's not clear that this was a common practice, we do see in Scripture that prophets were also anointed. Elijah anointed Elisha. Now, Jesus is distinguished in that he perpetually holds all three offices, king, priest, and prophet forever. But let's look back at what Peter says about us. But you are a chosen people, a royal. That sounds like kings and queens to me. Priesthood. So we're priests then. A holy nation, a people for God's own possession. To proclaim. Prophecy, huh? Hmm. The virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I believe that Peter was saying that Jesus is making us like him. I know your past wasn't great. I know your presence can be overwhelming at times. I know you fear the lack of control that you have over the future. But what does God say? You are marked as kings and queens. You are marked as priests and intercessors with God. You are marked as prophets called to proclaim the goodness of God. God is making us like him. Listen to me, church. He is fitting every detail of our lives into the tapestry of his plan. God changed Jacob's name, and he hasn't forgotten about you either. Do you trust him this morning? Are you grateful for the word of God this morning, church? Amen.